Hello, <clears throat> this is Christian Stempf welcoming you to our online webinar. Thank you for joining. Um, and before we start, uh, some housekeeping things. Um, just to inform you that this uh, session is recorded and you, you can retrieve it on our wh.com or video channel uh, wh.com. Question and answers. This is at the end of the presentation. Um, I have already taken into consideration uh, the questions that you posted on our channels. And the, for information, the live chat function is deactivated during the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, of course, it will be activated at the end of the presentation. Who am I? <laughs> Uh, I've been in the dental industry uh, for almost 30 years um, and I provide lectures to uh, dentists, healthcare professionals and infection or infection prevention, asepsis um, and reprocessing medical devices. I also offer comprehensive into the detail courses uh, for a dental assistant. Here we are. Um, obviously on reprocessing to the detail um, and also how to improve or design reprocessing areas. I'm also a member of the European Committee of Standardization. Since 1997, um, I'm following two working groups. This is on TC102. Uh, one working group, group five, regards uh, small steam and big steam sterilizers, and working group eight concerns thermal washer disinfectors. <clears throat> I had the privilege to co design, co develop uh, high end B type sterilizers. This was uh, before the, the year of 2000. Agenda. Um, we planned a 35 to 40 minutes presentation. Um, I first will touch on uh, environmental contamination, exposure to airborne infections, uh, the type and performance of uh, the different face masks. We have seen a lot, we have heard a lot on the news, and I just want to clarify to make sure we are all on the same page. And of course, the main topic is reuse and how to reprocess face masks. Therefore, we'll see acceptable methods and those we should absolutely exclude. In the end, and the list is long, uh, I'm going to provide you the basic precautions. Yeah, to give a sense of this presentation, uh, I know we have been scared by all the news we saw on TV and so on, but um, it's reality. And I always like to prove what I claim. Look, um, every person releases from 100 to 5,000 microorganisms per minute. You see here a study from Montpellier in France. You see um, a small guy, and depending if you are <coughs> moving a lot, you are um, dispersing particles. Which are these particles? We talk about skeins. Um, this is uh, you know, nails, hair, uh, skin, hundreds and hundreds, and nasopharyngeal droplets. I've seen on the, uh, on the internet, on Facebook, I think it was, uh, this fantastic uh, report from uh, NHK Japan uh, we can't see it uh, in, totally, but it also shows when people sneeze, when you sneeze, you expulse 100,000 droplets, when you cough, it's a bit less, and when people talk. So let's see this uh, abstract of the presentation, which talks by, by itself. And see this guy sneezing? We see big droplets, which is about the size of one millimeter. And these droplets, as you could see, they will drop, fall on the desk or whatever immediately. The smaller ones, the very small, uh, we call it aerosol, small particles, they will stay there. <clears throat> okay, and these particles will travel. They will travel around the, the person and around the, uh, the area. This is the second one showing two people chatting. 
Okay, two people chat, and these guys they speak loud apparently. And uh, so it's a bit less, but you see that this also releases small droplets, um, microscopic droplets, microscopic particles. This specific special camera could um, record particles uh, of the size of 0.1 micron. And here you see many people, you know, talking, chatting. One guy is coughing, and then you see how this is spread. Now you better understand why we all work from home <laughs> and uh, why people avoid to, to be together. After 20 minutes, I mean, the whole room is totally contaminated. Back to this study, French study, it shows that depending on the airflow, you know, some droplets, the heavier ones will drop quite immediately and the smaller ones, they can travel and travel up to 100 meters. As a result, as you see here, the more people, the higher the contamination. Uh, this is in a shopping mall. We talk about 4 million microorganisms in a square meter of air. Okay, This is why um, all, every government will implement, you know, uh, force people to wear masks when they go out, especially in the, in the metro and the buses or whatsoever, and shopping mall. On the street, it's far less, okay, less than 100,000. In the forest, on the beach, uh, it's almost 50 less than that. In the dental office, uh, we talk about 1,500 um, microorganisms. Now, what about your patients? Um, can we guess? I mean, who is infected? Maybe this guy is okay. He has a fantastic immune system. He has been hit, but he defends himself. So, very safe guy. But maybe this guy, oh, that's me. Maybe I'm infected. And even I do not know that I'm infected, okay? And um, you have this incubation time. It's quite short for the coronavirus, but uh, on hepatitis B, it can be from three to six months. HIV it can be up to 10 years. Can you imagine? For 10 years, you, are, you caught the HIV virus. You don't feel bad. It takes so much time until you get sick and people can recognize that you have a, an issue. And on every presentation I do, I emphasize, I stress this, that every patient, young, old, nice looking, every patient has, must be seen as a patient at risk. And I think that these days, um, people will pay more attention to these specific, uh, to specific topics. We will care more about our patients. Indeed, in the dental practice, uh, we recognized four transmission modes. I mean, ways you can contract an infection. The first one you saw it right now can come from aerosols or splatter coming from the patient's mouth. But don't forget, dentists, you use a dental chair, you use air and water cooling spray, which comes out from the handpiece at high pressure. And this will help improve increasing um, the number of microorganisms. The second or third way is direct contact with blood saliva or basically any body fluid because any body fluid can uh, contain small blood particles which you can't see. Or if your instruments are not reprocessed properly, especially hand pieces. Last but not least, hand and stuff and hands contribute a lot in dispersing a lot of contamination. Um, you see people are told, don't touch your mask with your hands because your hands are really highly contaminated. Look, this, this is um, five guys shaking hands. This was the first one, which was contaminated, shaked hands with the second person, who shaked hands with the third, fourth, fifth, and the fifth person still had uh, some contaminants from the first, uh, from the first guy. <coughs> Now, back to this uh, study from the UK. They have sampled um, the contamination very close to the patient's mouth, it's about one meter, and the second sampling at two meters from the patient's mouth. And they recognized that during drilling, you see it goes from 1,500, we talk here about colonies forming units, it goes up to 6,000. There's a video, but I can't, didn't, was not allowed to show it, but this video shows, and they talk even about 20 times, a 20 time increase of the contamination. It goes up, and then it goes down, because when you drill in the patient's mouth, 
you know, these hand pieces, they rotate at three, four hundred thousand RPMs with high pressure. They are driven by pressure. So you pressurize the mouth, and in the mouth, there are roughly 10 billion, 10 billion microorganisms. And from them, most of, of them are beneficial to us, but you can count on 100 million pathogens, streptococci, for example. So consider that uh, the rounding area on the, around the chair is heavily contaminated. <clears throat> there are different articles in the, in the literature, and now these days I see a lot published. Okay, this confirms that uh, drilling with spread microorganisms up to two meters. Sorry, I'm a bit rushing because uh, there's a lot to say. So we call these the airborne infections. And inside we have this uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. A short update uh, this morning from the Johns Hopkins University on the cases. 3.2 almost people infected worldwide. Um, 2 million cases, active cases still in recovery. And uh, some crucial uh, cases here. Good news, most of the people recover, but many, many people died. You know, I used to talk about this SARS virus to illustrate that uh, these microorganisms travel around the globe. I'm traveling a lot around the globe. And I was talking about uh, 8,000 8, people infected, around 800 people died from SARS. Now we talk about 217,000 people, and it's not, unfortunately, not finished. Okay, back to our story. Face masks. I mean, we have heard a lot, we read a lot, and uh, I think even I had never given so much attention to face masks. Um, and so I believe for you dentists as well. So just to clarify, we have this European norm that uh, this concerns surgical face masks. We have model 1, 2, 1, R, and 2, R. Very important, and this has to be recognized. And this mask is meant to protect the patient, not the wearer. Okay, so it will avoid that the patient is exposed to the doctor's um, infectious uh, particles, infectious um, infections. Um, of course, when you inhale, it will also protect you, but from big droplets. And this concerns only the two models with R. Okay, R means that uh, it is um, fluid resistant, 1R or 2R. The difference between 1 and 2 is that uh, we have a BFE, this is the bacterial filtration efficiency, which is up to 95% for the 1 and 98 for the 2. So the best to use is 2R, of course, because it protects you from splashes, splatters, bigger droplets, which still contain germs. but they do not protect you, okay, against very small airborne particles. You know, airborne is usually about below 50 microns, but we talk here about extremely small particles uh, below 5 microns. And in this case, you find also the, uh, the virus, obviously. So because of this, and also because of the loose fit, because many people that don't wear the masks properly, um, on both sides, they don't, they're not tight to your face, they don't fit properly, and uh, so they don't provide a nice fit. And I know many dentists, they exclusively, exclusively use surgical masks, so I believe that they will rethink twice before putting back a surgical mask, and either switch to um, FFP masks. I mean, this is another norm, EN149, Okay, and these masks, they offer higher filtration. And they are meant, designed for the wearer to protect the doctor from any infection. It will stop any uh, airborne particle below five microns. Okay. There are three models defined, FFP1, FFP2, and three. This concerns the level of uh, filtration. Um, FFP1 is 80%, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But FFP2 masks 
uh, they will retain 94% uh, of the particles below 0.3 micron. This equals to the N95, but N95 or KN for China 95 is 95%. 95 of course, this means this is a minimum required. And you will see later in our in our studies that some FFP2 masks they go up to 97, 98 percent, uh, which is uh, which is quite nice. <clears throat> then we have 99. This is the FFP3 or N99. Uh, this retains 99 percent of the 0.3 micron particles. Now the question is. Shall we use one with or without exhalation valves? Well, exhalation valves makes it more comfortable for you. When you exhale, it will facilitate. However, the air which is exhaled is not filtered, so you would put your patients at risk if you are infected. So my recommendation would be without um, exhalation valves. And we'll see later that these valves may suffer depending how you reprocess these valves. Okay, just checking I got a message now. I received feedback on the uh, how it works. Okay, this um <laughs> I didn't finish this this part of the presentation um because many people ask me but uh, okay we talk about 0.3 micron infiltration. But the coronavirus is 0 0.06 micron. So how can this mask filter such a small particle? And I wanted to develop more this, um, this part, but to make it very simple. Uh, 0 0.3 micron has been uh, defined as the uh, most penetrating particle size. Basically, in the air, they fly straight. So the mask should uh, break them. Smaller particles are so small and so light that they don't uh, travel in a straight manner, but in a kind of zigzag way. So they will impact the multi-layer mask and they will be trapped, although they are smaller than 0.3 micron. And we talk also about these HEPA filters. They mention also 0.3 microns, sometimes 0.1. On the autoclave, we have the bacterial filter, 0.3, again, because below the 0.3, the particles, they travel in a random uh, bouncing way, like zigzagging and uh, getting catched by uh, impact. So the intended use, we saw surgical mask, FFP2, FFP1, FFP3. Now this is a quick uh, summary. If you um, provide medical care or minor surgery without any risk of fluid spray produced, then the um, type 2 is okay. Surgical mask type 2. If there is a moderate uh, or a light, I mean heavy, moderate or light in the end, you should use the 2R, you know, these fluid resistant surgical masks. Now, and I think things will change uh, from now on. If you treat patients with airborne diseases, and I remind you, we cannot always know, even your patient cannot tell you, oh, I'm, I'm infected. So you presume that every patient is infected it's a potential danger, so you will now switch to the FFP2 masks. And the patient, this is now another separate topic that uh, the patient in the waiting room, uh, while talking to secretary, must wear a surgical mask. I mean, some countries are already mandatory. You see, even in laundry services from CSSDs, for example, people who are sorting um, used um, uh, instruments and uh, masks, they should wear FFP1. So even not a surgical mask, but FFP1. I remind you, this filters 80% of the particles, which is which is quite nice. And if you have to, uh, you, you visit or uh, you, you you care about patients, uh, especially in hospitals, uh, who are infected, FFP2. Why reuse single-use masks? And uh, I mean, you will see you know, in my examples, but uh, of course, it's obvious to all of us because of an increasing demand. Now, not only healthcare providers must wear masks, but also 
you and I, we all must wear masks, especially going for shopping and so on. Um, and of course, shortage or unreliable supply. Now, these masks are single use and disposable. Okay, this means you cannot use twice and you cannot, uh, you must drop them. They are absolutely not designed to be reprocessed. And this will be also in every, in every paper you can read, and I will show some examples. That's the first phrase. It's single use and not um, sterilizable or cannot be reprocessed. But in this emergency situation, lack of masks or supplies, many countries have reconsidered this. And I must recognize in the last weeks or days, it has been very, very fast. I mean, many countries came up, every day you see new studies, new um, um, comments, papers, uh, movies, uh, videos coming up. This is from Austria, for example. And I think it's one of the first countries uh, that started. <clears throat> this is the Austrian Society for Sterile Goods Supply. And like me, they say the mask is single use and cannot be reprocessed. But because of the situation, we have investigated. And uh, they could not supply masks like, like most of our countries. So they had to come up with a with solution, you know, kind of emergency solution. So this is the preferred solution. Steam sterilization at 121 degrees Celsius, 20 minutes. For the US, it's 250 Fahrenheit. Um, and they have processed once and had not uh, seen any negative effect on the filtration performance. They tried also at a high temperature, it's slightly faster, it's also an option, but then you can see some damage on the elastic cords, exhalation valves, you see, exhalation valves and the nose clips. Now every mask is different, okay, I want just to stress this, there are so many masks on the market, good ones, bad ones, and um, this one, two times sterilization, it really depends, it matters on the quality of the mask. And maybe some masks cannot be reprocessed. Okay. It's always nice if you get any advice now from the mask manufacturer, from your supplier. Um, this is another option, steam disinfection at 105. Um, we will see also later some, um, um, some procedures you should avoid. And uh, when we talk about sterilization, Obviously, we focus on the coronavirus, but this is a very fragile virus, so it's kind of easy to inactivate. But you also want to sterilize the other microorganisms. And at 105, we talk about disinfection. Okay, so, but again, I mean, it depends what is available. I and mean, if you are a dentist, if you are in a hospital, it depends what is available. And that's the uh, preferred choice, second choice, third choice. Now, they also mentioned that uh, this is a uh, sterilization at uh, ethylene oxide or low temperature steam form formaldehyde, you know, the chemical lab, can be also used. However, they have noticed some residues and some damages uh, on the filtration material. I'll come back to some other possibilities, um, alternatives. This is from Germany. And I want to stress that Germany shows one of the lowest rate of infected people and deaf people, lucky them. Congratulations. Um, and they kind of, of course, repeat the same thing, that uh, they cannot be uh, uh, reprocessed, but this is the ultimate way. It's the emergency solution. What do they recommend? Uh, they, that's one thing important, they've added that, and I recommend that the staff that does reprocess, we will see the different steps, that does reprocess masks should be properly trained um, and to provide a very uh, efficient result. So they prefer choices, fractionated vacuum steam sterilization, 121, and also a vacuum steam vacuum sterilization at 105, then back to disinfection. Um, um, of course, all these statements, the Austrian statement and uh, most of the European countries uh, have based their guidance, not to say laws, uh, based on proven studies. I will talk about dry heat uh, in a minute.
This is very interesting. This is a study from the Dutch uh, uh, University from Delft. It's a very good job and uh, thank you so much because many, many people make reference to this for, for granted. <clears throat> and they've done the tests, proper tests to check uh, how often they can, how many times they can be um, sterilized and they've compared with uh, new masks, okay? Result is the permit, the filtration capacity did not change. You see here, this is FFP2, remember, 94%. Um, Even after five times sterilization, it's still above 94 or 95, which would be the N95. So it shows that you can use it six times. It has no effect um, on the water repellent properties. So basically, it was good for use. Some words from the US. <clears throat> Interesting here, they are really tested in real conditions. Fabric, um, you know, pieces of mask which had been exposed to this coronavirus. They have tried um, hydrogen peroxide, dry heat at 70 degrees, ultraviolet, and 70% ethanol spray. Again, I'm come back, I'll come back to this uh, very shortly, uh, just to show you who tested and how they tested. Okay, they said two times uh, reprocessing is okay, so three can be used three times. However, ethanol spray damaged the uh, respirator after two treatments, so it's not the number one recommendation. UV and heat show uh, good results, but uh, seal problems after three treatments. I will develop this also in a, in a second. Now, as you could see, uh, the main uh, result is uh, 121, uh, 15 minutes. I just want to point out, I'm French, and uh, I know in my country, uh, there's no official um, you know, release for this technique. So I know there are French dentists listening to me, I'm sorry, but uh, in France, so far, I have not uh, heard about uh, any guideline or acceptance of this technique. Now, we talk about steam sterilization. I just want to tell you, you cannot maybe take any sterilizer or any cycle that might not be appropriate. I don't want to make it too long, but look, basically, this is a batch of masks. Um, this is an autoclave. This is an old one. It's designed by Jean Berlin and Louis Pasteur in the 1880s. But still, the type of cycle, you know, is still available on some, some machines. So it's a very, let's say, simple cycle that fills the chamber with steam. But the problem, it pushes out the air here. But this is a big porous pack. Right? So you have air pockets which stay there. They are trapped inside this batch of masks. So inside air, we can't reach the uh, uh, sterilization conditions. So you have some points inside this pulse load where um, sterilization will not succeed. This is the cycle profile. Sorry to be technical, so you may not uh, follow me, but uh, it's quite crucial to understand this. We usually focus on hollow instruments like hand pieces to remove air from the tubings. Now we talk about removing air in a porous pack, in a pouched uh, mask. So the machine will pull out the air with a vacuum pump. It shows here on the video. So in one, in one vacuum shot, vacuum pulse, the machine is able to remove 90% of, of air. Then the machine will inject steam, like you show here, pressure pulse one. We have 90% steam. Then the machine does a second vacuum to achieve 1% residual air, inject steam again, then here we have like 99% steam, 1% air. Then the machine will do a third vacuum, some machines do four or five depending on the power of the pump, and here we have mainly no vacuum, no air inside the chamber, total vacuum. <coughs> So, this European standard classifies cycles, NSB. Um, B, this is the medical grade cycle. N, forget it, S is a specific cycle for specific products. You cannot sterilize everything, but some specific products. 
I'm rushing a little bit now. Um, look, this is the classification of the different families. So depending on what you have to sterilize, in our case, we talk about now pose load, you must check that the cycle is designed, is compatible with pose. It's a case of this machine, for example. However, it says maximum 0.5 kilo because the manufacturer guarantees total sterilization and drying up to half a kilo. This one not. I think it would be to use the B type cycle. You know, this is the B comes from big sterilizer. So either use a B type cycle or a specific cycle, and this I recommend you to talk to your supplier to get it confirmed to you. Now, if it's even better, if your manufacturer can test this, and this is what we have done with all our models. Um, we have loaded as many as we could. We loaded 60 uh, single pouch masks, so this will keep them sterile after processing. Um, this is an unusual also uh, loading technique. This is also why it's important that you check with your manufacturer, because we, we supply the machines with five trays, and you will split the normal instruments on five trays. Here, because of space, we put as many as we could, and uh, this is recognizable like a full pose load, but it's very light. We talk about uh, 360 grams. So easy, let's say, to process and to, and to, uh, to uh, dry. For some countries, we have to run biomerosal indicators. So we have put several uh, indicators in different pouches, pouch number one, number seven, 15, 22. So we split them inside the load. We check that at every level, uh, we met the sterilization conditions. We have used our B-type cycle at 121, this one. The dryness has been checked. We also double checked with the external laboratory. Um, so all our models, uh, you will recognize the one you have, they passed the test. This is pouch 60, 52. You see all the bio indicators were passed. Up to 60 masks. So we can, you know, guarantee you that the machine will process 60 uh, masks, either you know, face masks, uh, surgical masks, or FFP2 masks. This is an MS machine. It's a machine that is um, meant for veterinary or podologists. So it is not as powerful as these machines, but still, we can guarantee you this machine can sterilize and dry up to 17 pouches. I mean, cycles, depending on the machine, goes from half an hour to 45, 50 minutes. So it's quite fast. We've checked also the, um, the paper of the mask and uh, without noticing any alteration. This study is going to be published and available uh, in case you need it. Excuse me, but I'm just... Now, these are the questions. Um, we received on internet. Can I expose my mask to the sun? Can I put it in a freezer, in a rice cooker? Alcohol, soaking alcohol and let it dry. Uh, water and soap, hair dryer, oven over 70 degrees. Placed over uh, basically boiling water while cooking. And this is my feedback, okay? Forget about all these things. I've seen that um, in Asia, they, they use rice cooker uh, they talk about, about uh, moist heat. I mean, this was run without any water. So they placed them in a hot pot for three minutes plus five minutes. So in no way I would uh, uh, acknowledge such a, such a process. This oven, okay, let, this reminds me of, of, of dry heat sterilization, which will come in a couple of slides. We talked about steam sterilization, the type of cycle you must use. Now, what is left? What else can I use? I don't have a sterilizer. What can I use? Well, this is concerns mainly hospital sterilization, CSSDs. They use vaporized hydrogen peroxide. You know, we wrongly call this plasma, uh, but the real term is vaporized H2O. It's a low temperature sterilization process, uh, below 55, uh, with low moisture. It works. I mean, there are some studies uh, that prove this, and uh, some countries have committed to this uh, process. Um, although it's non-toxic, there is no residue. Um, the Dutch Institute 
you know, they also tested this and they say, look, allow at least one hour of degassing, just to make sure that when you put it back on your face, it is not, uh, doesn't smell, it's not uh, dangerous. One specification, one specific thing is that you can't use a uh, paper plastic pouch, you must use Tyvek pouches. Maybe you've seen this, that um, in the US, uh, with heavily affected um, uh, this method was uh, late March, was FDA released for use. Um, it's called the Battle Decontamination System, Emergent System. So it's uh, all these instruments in a big, big room, they're exposed to hydrogen peroxide for two and a half hours. This is acceptable. Now dry heat. We read a lot about this. And my friends in Austria just make me aware that uh, there was some program on TV saying that maybe it's not that efficient. Okay, let's talk about it. As a principle, these machines are oven. If that's why I've put uh, orange on oven. Um, and in some countries for dentists, it's forbidden to use oven because there are disadvantages. Why? Um, first of all, you must have a cycle at 70, 80 degrees. Uh, these machines would run normally uh, to sterilize everything it is like uh, 180 degrees for half an hour. Half an hour is after preheating. Once you reach the temperature, you keep for half an hour. Or two hours at 170. So when we talk about 70 uh, for 30 minutes, we talk about the fragile viruses, the envelope viruses, like the coronavirus are extremely fragile. Might be enough. Then other issues are heat, uh, repetition, how much time it needs to uh, to penetrate that heat reaches the heart of the uh, of the load. This is unknown. You see, the, in the US, uh, NH uh, National Institute of Health say maybe okay, but then you should do up to sixty minutes. Then we have the French guy, Dr. Professor Rémi Charel from the Exmas University. That's a one hour drive from my home. He says that. Um, it should be easy for one hour and still showing some surviving strains. Uh, so he's not so convinced about dry heat. And he also confirms that to inactivate the uh, coronavirus, it should be exposed to almost boiling water uh, to make sure that you inactivate it properly. So this is not uh, a method that I would recommend. It is, if you have nothing else, then uh, it's better than nothing. I mean. Uh, this is the, uh, the priority list. Then also saw the thermal washer drying phase. Drying phase, this is the last phase. So not every washer has a pulse air drying phase. Um, might not offer 70 degree for half an hour or more. It takes time to reach this temperature. So it is not the preferred choice, although Although I've seen that uh, the private clinics uh, from the Helios group, they have um, had their machines modified, their washers modified, to implement a program, a drying program of 70 degrees Celsius for half an hour. After the process, they pouch the, the, the masks. That's another weak point of dry heat, you can't pouch before. So they would pouch, they travel to another place, and to achieve, and we call it A0-3000, to achieve high levels of infection, uh, they keep them for nine hours in an oven at 70, 75 degrees Celsius. So, up to you too. <laughs> Ultraviolet irradiation. It's a promising method. It depends on the dose which is applied, applied on the masks. Uh, every UV lamp is different, and be careful, UV is harmful, so it must be really run by specific uh, people. Be careful on your eyes and skin. And this is very important, this, therefore I'm not so convinced. A UV light can only inactivate what it can illuminate. And because of merely folded masks, uh, some parts of the mask are not uh, illuminated, so we believe that it's not going to be sterile uh, everywhere, in every layer. 
I'm running a bit late, sorry about that. <clears throat> now, other methods which are included alcohol, microwave, uh, soap, and water. Um, these methods uh, cannot be used because they lead to, uh, to issues, uh, damages on the filtration capacity, performance, and for some of them, older, not suitable for, for your reuse. The Dutch university, very um, busy university, they tested the gamma uh, masks and they noticed damage of the filtration capacity. As a conclusion, general precautions, the list is very long. You understand that it's an unusual procedure. So if any mask is damaged, dirty, heavily, you know, dirty, full of blood, uh, it shall not be reprocessed. Of course, not discarded like this. This is a short form. Uh, okay. <laughs> then you disinfect your hands prior to removing your masks and putting a new one. You will not touch the uh, filtration uh, part of the mask, but if as much as possible, use grab the mask by the elastic cords. After use, before you reprocess, you should because when you when you exhale, the mask will be humid. So you should not put them in a box until you reprocess them because humid masks they will grow microorganisms, so they should be dried before you process them and also after they have been processed, especially the are pouch to keep them sterile inside. This is also one recommendation that uh, it's a non procedure, totally different. You saw different loading methods of the autoclaves, so one person should be really in contact with the supplier and follow the instructions of the manufacturer, if they are some. <coughs> Indispensable is uh, write on the mask, on the cord, of course, uh, how many times the mask has been reprocessed. And nice to do, I mean, I would like to put back my mask and not my neighbor's mask. So nice to put, if possible, if feasible, the name of the user so the, the person can put back his own mask. It's not finished. Before you reuse a mask, you must check the mask, especially the ones with the valves, check the functioning of the valve. Properly wear the mask, and I see always mistakes. Check the tightness of the PP mask, how it fits to your face. Um, and um, sorry, my picture is late. Yes, here it is. This is the proper way to wear a mask. And I still see people like this because they are rushing uh, they don't wear them properly. So you see, this is a loose part and air, non-filtered air, will flow through the easiest way. Okay. So use them properly. Now, after three hours or eight hours of continuous use for 2R and FFP2 respectively, they must be changed after continuous use. Never touch the filtration paper while manipulating or, you know, adjusting your mask and wear them properly, okay? How many times you see this in the, in the, in the news? And even some, some doctors do not wear them uh, properly. You should replace them when dirty, humid, when you move them to your neck. You, your neck is absolutely contaminated. So if you put it on your neck and back to your face, you will put microorganisms directly in your mouth. And after each interruption, basically between patients, unless to keep them for, for half a day, uh, like I, I can see that doctors are going to use FFP2 masks and use two masks a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, without touching them, without removing them. Um, now, moustache and beards, they do not help you know, to have a tight fitting. So it's nice to shave uh, to guarantee uh, safe protection. As a conclusion, this unusual, exceptional way of reprocessing should be stopped once you are back to normal uh, and um, masks are available. I recommend to reprocess them 
once or twice, but not more. Okay. Um, now again, I want to stress that there are so many masks on the market, good ones, bad ones. Maybe your masks cannot be reprocessed. It's as easy as that. So you cannot blame the reprocessing technique, but maybe the quality of your mask. I recommend to use FFP2 or better FFP3 mask without valves. You remember because you don't filter and they don't filter the exhaled air. And this came too early. Why not, you know, recommending to your patients before treatment to uh, run through mouth rinse. This will drastically re reduce the number of micro rings I always and always recommend this. It's so easy, not so expensive. Uh, the patient feels like, you know, looked after, well looked after, and uh, it reduces by 64 and on average uh, the number of microorganisms, the colonies forming unit. Good. I hope this was comprehensive information that. Uh, you got some news, uh, some insight in this uh, hot topic. This is my email address. Uh, you can openly email to me. And remember, we have uh, we have uh, recorded this video. So now I expect my colleagues to to provide me some guidance on how we're going to how we're going to proceed with questions. Do we have questions? I believe that the chat is open and uh, someone should uh, <laughs> give me uh, some information. Otherwise, I'm really happy if you can email to me, kristen.stemf at tabunetch.com. Well, no news, good news. It means that uh, it was helpful and clear for you. So I take the opportunity to thank you again for joining. It was a real pleasure for me. It was my first experience um, and uh, looking forward to uh, other ones. Um, thank you for joining and uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.